All right, this is The Lightning Thief by Rick Reardon, uh, Chapter 18, Annabeth Does Obedience School, Part 1. We stood in the shadows of Valencia Boulevard looking up at gold letters etched in black marble, DOA Recording Studios. Underneath, stenciled on the glass doors, no solicitors, no, lo no solicitors, no loitering, no living. It was almost midnight, but the lobby was brightly lit and full of people. Behind the security desk sat a tough-looking guard with sunglasses and an earpiece. I turned to my friends. Okay, you remember the plan. The plan, Grover gulped. Yeah, I love the plan. Annabeth said, what happens if the plan doesn't work? Don't think negative. Right, she said. We're entering the land of the dead, and I shouldn't think negative. I took the pearls out of my pocket. The three, <laughs> the three milky spheres the Nereid had given me in Santa Monica, they didn't seem like much of a backup in case something went wrong. Annabeth put her hand on my shoulder. I'm sorry, Percy. You're right. We'll make it. It'll be fine. <clears throat> she gave Grover a nudge. Oh, right, he chimed in. We got this far. We'll find the Master Bolt and save your mom. No problem. I looked at them both and felt really grateful. Only a few minutes before, I'd almost gotten them stretched to death on deluxe waterbeds, and now they were trying to be brave for my sake, trying to make me feel better. I slipped the pearls back in my pocket. Let's whoop some underworld butt. We walked inside the DOA lobby. Muzak played softly on hidden speakers. The carpet and walls were steel gray. Pencil cactuses grew in the corners like skeleton hands. The furniture was black leather, and every seat was taken. There were people sitting on couches, people standing up, and people staring out windows or waiting for the elevator. Nobody moved or talked or did much of anything. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see them all just fine, but if I focused on any one of them in particular, they started looking transparent. I could see right through their bodies. The security guard's desk was a raised podium, so we look, I had to look up at him. He was tall and elegant with chocolate-colored skin and bleached blonde hair shaved military style. He wore tortoise, tortoise shell shades and a silk Italian suit that matched his hair. A black rose was pinned to his lapel under a silver name tag. I read the name tag, then looked at him in bewilderment. Your name is Chiron? He leaned across the desk. I couldn't see anything in his glasses except my own reflection, but his smile was sweet and cold like a python's right before it eats you. What a precious young lad, he had a strange accent. British maybe, but also as if he had learned English as a second language. Tell me, mate, do I look like a centaur? No. Sir, he added smoothly. Sir, I said. He pinched the name tag and ran his finger under the letters. Can you read this, mate? It says C-H- a-R-O-N. Say it with me. Care on. Care on. Amazing. Now, Mr. Care on. Mr. Care on, I said. Well done, he sat back. I hate being confused with that old horseman. And now, how may I help you, little dead ones? His question caught my stomach like a fastball. I looked at Annabeth for support. We want to go to the underworld, she said. Charon's mouth twitched. Well, that's refreshing. It is, she asked. Straightforward and honest. No screaming. No, there must be a mistake, Mr. Charon. He looked us over. How did you die then? I nudged Grover. Oh, he said, um, drowned in, in the bathtub? All three of you? We nodded. Big bathtub. Charon looked mildly impressed. I don't suppose you have coins for passage. Normally with adults, you see, I could charge your American Express or add the ferry price to your last cable bill. But with children, alas, you never die prepared. Suppose you have to take a seat for a few centuries. Oh, but we have coins. I set three golden drachmas on the counter, part of the stash I'd found in Krusty's office desk. Well now. Charon moistened his lips. Real drachmas. 
Real golden drachmas. I haven't seen these in... His fingers hovered greedily over the coins. We were so close. Then Charon looked at me. That cold stare behind his glasses seemed to bore a hole through my chest. Here now, he said. You couldn't read my name correctly. Are you dyslexic, lad? No, I said. I'm dead. Charon leaned forward and took a sniff. You're not dead. I should have known. You're a godling. We have to get to the underworld, I insisted. Charon made a growling sound deep in his throat. Immediately, all the people in the waiting room got up and started pacing, agitated, lighting cigarettes, running hands through their hair, or checking their wristwatches. Leave while you can, Karen told us. I'll just take these and forget I saw you. He started to go for the coins, but I snatched them back. No service, no tip. I tried to sound braver than I felt. Karen growled again, a deep, blood-chilling sound. The spirits of the dead started pounding on the elevator doors. It's a shame, too, I sighed. We had more to offer. I held up my, the entire bag from Krusty's stash. I took out a fistful of drachmas and let the coins spill through my fingers. Charon's growl changed into something more like a lion's purr. Do you think I can be bought, godling? Yeah, just out of curiosity, how much have you got there? A lot. I said, I bet Hades doesn't pay you well enough for such hard work. Oh, you don't know the half of it. How would you like to babysit these spirits all day? Always, please don't let me be dead, or please let me across for free. I haven't had a pay raise in 3,000 years. Do you imagine suits like this come cheap? You deserve better, I agreed. A little appreciation, respect, good pay. With each word, I stacked another gold coin on the counter. Charon glanced down at his silk Italian jacket as if imagining himself in something even better. I must say, lad, you're making some sense now, just a little. I stacked another few coins. I could mention a pay raise while I'm talking to Hades. He sighed. The boat's almost full anyway. I might as well add you three and be off. He stood, scooped up our money and said, come along. We pushed through the crowd of waiting spirits who started grabbing at our clothes like the wind. Their voices whispering things I couldn't make out. Charon shoved them out of the way, grumbling, freeloaders. Yes, he escorted us up into the elevator, which was already crowded with souls of the dead, each one holding a green boarding pass. Charon grabbed two spirits who were trying to get on with us and pushed them back into the lobby. Right, now no one get any ideas while I'm gone, he announced to the waiting room. And if anyone moves the dial off my easy listening station again, I'll make sure you're here for another thousand years. Understand? He shut the doors, put a key card into a slot in the elevator panel, and we started to descend. What happens to the spirits waiting in the lobby, Annabeth asked. Nothing. For how long? Forever, until I'm, or until I'm feeling generous. Oh, she said, that's fair. Charon raised an eyebrow. Whoever said death was fair, young miss, wait until it's your turn. You'll die soon enough where you're going. We'll get out alive, I said. Ha! I got a sudden dizzy feeling. We weren't going down anymore, but forward. The air turned misty. Spirits around me started changing shape. Their modern clothes flickered, turning into gray hooded robes. The floor of the elevator began swaying. I blinked hard. When I opened my eyes, Charon's creamy Italian suit had been replaced by a long black robe. His tortoiseshell glasses were gone. Where his eyes should have been were empty sockets, like Ari's eyes, except Charon's were totally dark, full of night and death and despair. He saw me looking and said, well, Nothing, I managed. I thought he was grinning, but that wasn't it. The flesh of his face was becoming transparent, letting me see straight through to his skull. The floor kept swaying. Grover said, I think I'm getting seasick. When I blinked again, the elevator wasn't an elevator anymore. We were standing in a wooden barge. Charon was pulling us across a dark, oily river 
swirling with bones, dead fish, and other stranger things, plastic dolls, crushed carnations, soggy diplomas with gilt edges. The river sticks, Annabeth murmured. It's so polluted, Charon said. For thousands of years, you humans have been throwing everything as you come across. Hopes, dreams, wishes that never came true. Irresponsible waste management, if you ask me. Mist curled off the water, uh, the filthy water. Above us, almost lost in the gloom, was a ceiling of stalactites. Ahead, the far shore glimmered with greenish light, the color of poison. Panic closed up my throat. What was I doing here? These people around me, they were dead. Annabeth grabbed a hold of my hand. Under normal circumstances, this would have embarrassed me, but I understood how she felt. She wanted reassurance that somebody else was alive on this boat. I found myself muttering a prayer, though I wasn't quite sure who I was praying to. Down here, only one God mattered, and he was the one I had come to confront. The shoreline of the underworld came into view. Craggy rocks and black volcanic sand stretched inland about a hundred yards to the base of a high stone wall, which marched off in either direction as far as we could see. A sound came from somewhere nearby in the green gloom, echoing off the stones, the howl of a large animal. All three faces hungry, Charon said. His smile turned skeletal in the greenish light. Bad luck for you, godlings. The bottom of our boat slid onto the black sand. The dead began to disembark. A woman holding a little girl's hand, an old man and an old woman hobbling along arm in arm. A boy no older than I was, shuffling silently along in his gray robe. Karen said, I wish I'd wish you luck, mate, but there isn't any down here. Mind you, don't forget to mention my pay raise. He counted our golden coins into his pouch, then took up his pole. He warbled something that sounded like a Barry Manilow song as he ferried the empty barge back across the river. We followed the spirits up a well-worn path. I'm not sure what I was expecting, pearly gates or a big black portcullis or something, but the entrance to the underworld looked like a cross between airport security and the Jersey Turnpike. There were three separate entrances under one huge black archway that said, you are now entering Erebus. Each entrance had a pass-through metal detector with security cameras mounted on top. Beyond this were toll booths manned by black robbed ghouls like Charon. I'm gonna look up, I'm gonna copy this word to look it up later. Ah, portcullis. Oh, just look it up. A portcullis from Old French uh, is a heavy vertically closing gate typically found in medieval fortifications consisting of a lattice grill made of wood or metal which slides down the grooves with each jam of the gateway. Okay. I'm going to copy it too and see if we can get a picture later. The howling of the hungry animal was really loud now, but I couldn't see where it was coming from. The three-headed dog, Cerberus, who was supposed to guard Hades' door, was nowhere to be seen. The dead queued up in three lines. Two marked attendant on duty and one marked easy death. The easy death line was moving right along. The other two were crawling. What do you figure? I asked Annabeth. The fast line must go straight to Asphodel Fields, she said. No contest. They don't want to risk judgment from the court because it might go against them. There's a court for dead people? Yeah, three judges. They switch around who sits on the bench. King Minos, Thomas Jefferson, Shakespeare, people like that. Thomas Jefferson, Shakespeare, two different people. Sometimes they look at a life and decide the person needs a special reward. The Fields of Elysium. Sometimes they decide on punishment. But most people, well, they just lived. Nothing special, good or bad. So they go to the Asphodel Fields. And do what? Grover said, I imagine standing in a wheat field in Kansas forever. Harsh, I said. Not as harsh as that, Grover muttered. Look, and we'll stop here. Let's save the 